Amen. Thanks, Steve. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone and be seen by everyone for those who are joining us online. And uh, thanks for the confirmation that we've made the right choice to go back to two services because we have like no seats left, which is a great problem to have. And uh, so, but we are thrilled that everybody's here. Hey, if you came today and you didn't sign up to stay for our fifth Sunday fellowship any, uh, after the service and you wonder if we're going to have enough food and stuff, just stay. You, know, you can be like me. My prayer, I am always at the back of the line, and my prayer is there will be no food left so I can start with dessert, right? So if you're at the end of the line and we run out of food, you can start with dessert. So just stay and join us. Put on a name tag so we can kind of put names and faces back together and, and all that kind of good things. Hey, I want to say one thing about our two services next week. We know that there is a group among us that even with the availability of vaccines and all those kinds of things, they're still in a place for a number of different life circumstances that just, they're just not able to be out in a crowd unless the people around them are wearing a mask and they're also wearing a mask. And so one of the things we're trying to explore is whether or not in our 1030 service, and the reason we're choosing that is that historically our 1030 service had a little lighter attendance than our nine o'clock service, in our 1030 service, if we could designate an area of our worship center for those who sit there would all, would all be wearing masks and there would still be plenty of room for everybody else. But if that's something that would meet a need for you, especially those of you who are joining on us online and haven't come back yet because you feel just a little uncomfortable, if that would meet a need, would you let us know? Call the office, send me an email, send a carrier pigeon, drive by my house, whatever it takes, just let us know. One of the reasons we want to know kind of up front is we don't want to have like three people sitting over here by themselves and everybody else over here. So we're trying to get a gauge for that. But our heart through this whole journey has been to, to do what they've asked us to do because we are a spiritual community. We're not a scientific community. We're not a medical community. We're not going to make those judgments. So we're going to do what they've asked us to do as we're faithful to the gospel. And then with that, in that context, we're trying to serve as many people as we can. So if that, doing that would help you be connected, let us know. We'd love to try to find a way to figure that out and to move forward. Hey, so um, we're going to continue on with our series today called Great Comebacks. And I know some of you are like me when you watch like a Netflix series or an Amazon Prime series, you like to just skip the intro. Well, I'm not going to skip the intro today, right? Because we have enough visitors that are here and people who are in and out that, that I need to kind of bring us up to where we are at in our journey. So for those of you who are just kind of tuning in now, where we've been, right, you know, previously on Great Comebacks, to use that terminology at the, at the beginning of our show, we, we've been looking at um, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah for guidance from God about how to have a great spiritual comeback with God, to be able to renew, refresh, or establish for the very first time our relationship with God. And, and so the context that we've been looking at are the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And the reason we put those together is that they tell the same story, and actually in the Hebrew Bible, they were together as a single book for for literally for hundreds and hundreds of years until they got separated three or four years after the life of Christ. And so the, what's going on in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah is that God had sent the people of Judah, the southern kingdom of his, uh, uh, among the Jewish people, he had sent them into a divine timeout, right? They, he, he had, he had, punished them, taken away their privileges, slapped their hands. He'd done all this kind of stuff for hundreds of years. They really never did give themselves completely and learn the lesson. So God said, I'm going to put you in a divine timeout for 70 years. And he used the nation of Babylon to conquer the, conquer the Judah, took really the heart and soul of Judah into exile, and then he just leveled the city. Destroyed the temple, destroyed the altar, tore down the walls, left it vulnerable, and it sat that way for 70 years. And the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are in that time of per period where God's ready to keep his promises and end the, the, div the, the divine timeout. He wants to bring the people back. And what he does in his sovereignty is he raises up a different superpower, the Persians, who conquer the Babylonians, and he puts in their heart Right? He puts in the heart of Cyrus, the king of Persia, that uh, a desire for his, his foreign policy is to be about building loyalty from the vassal states by allowing them to rebuild. By doing them favors, 
which includes rebuilding their cities and rebuilding their worship because he doesn't want any gods mad at them either, right? He, 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 allows, he allows the nations to rebuild, and in that we see Zerubbabel and some others return to the promised land, to the city of Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple and to rebuild the altar. And that took place about 537 B.C. It was a, quite a journey. It took them about almost 20 years to get everything all done with the temple, right? Then there's the next phase of return. And that's when Ezra comes back. And, and the concern of the kings at that point was, we, we want the people who are in our vassal states to be actually living for the gods that they supposedly serve, right? Because we don't want any of the gods mad at us. So we want to make sure. So Ezra is sent by, back as a great teacher of the law. And in that journey, the people recognize that they have, really have not been set apart like they're supposed to be. And they make some decisions to reconstitute, if you will, to come out from among the nations and to be the people of God. Now, in the book of Nehemiah, which we're going to see today, which took place right around 455 B.C., right around that time frame. So this is like 70 to 80 years later after the days of Zerubbabel. Um, at Nehemiah goes back because the city walls had still not been restored. So imagine living in your house and you've got no windows and no doors. And you live in a crime-infested neighborhood. You feel just a little vulnerable. That's exactly the way the, the city was. And we're going to look at the story of Nehemiah over the next three weeks. Now, here's, here's what I w w want us to see. that our, our, our journey, our pilgrimage back to God mirrors theirs, but in a different way. The very first thing we have to do, like them reconstructing the temple and rebeginning um, worship via the altar, was that the first thing we have to do is, is reestablish a relationship with God. That's the very first step in our spiritual comeback. That's why Jesus says, come, follow me. And we have those this morning who are going to testify to the fact that they've had that experience of coming and following me. Second is that there, there's a need to then, in that relationship, to begin to live. Curtis, there's a couple seats right up here if you, they want to come all the way to the front. <laughs> there we go. It's a great problem to have, right? And uh, if you're sitting on that, maybe you can slide in a little bit. We still have a couple more people who are looking for seats and that kind of thing. The second aspect is literally to say, okay, I've reestablished this relationship with God. Now I'm actually going to step out and I'm going to live for God. And today we're going to look at trying to rebuild our lives around the truth of God. So I'd love for you to grab a Bible and turn to the book of Nehemiah with me. If you're using one of our Bibles that's underneath your chair or in the chair in front of you, it's on page, we're going to, our text today is going to be on page 418, and we're actually going to look at the first six chapters in bits and pieces today. We're, we're only going to do three messages out of Nehemiah. One today, we're going to look at how, the role and how we deal with opposition in the midst of our spiritual comeback. Then we're going to look at the role of prayer, and then we're going to look at sustaining comebacks. How do we actually sustain and keep change going, right? So we're in the book of Nehemiah, and um, just a little introduction to Nehemiah. Let me read just a few verses from chapter 1 and then a little bit from the beginning of chapter 2 and introduce you to Nehemiah, know what his role is, and then we'll pick up the text from there. So the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. During the month of Sheslev in the 20th year, when I was in the fortress city of Susa, well, that's the capital of Persia, Hananiah, one of my brothers, arrived with men from Judah, and I questioned them about Jerusalem and the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. And they said to me, the remnant in the province who survived the exile, they're in great trouble and disgrace. Jerusalem's walls had, Jerusalem's wall had been broken down and its gate had been burned. When I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for no, a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of the heavens. Nehemiah is in the capital of Persia. He gets word from back home that things are not good. In fact, things are really, really bad. And he's, he's heartbroken and he's burdened about it. And he begins to pray. We pick up the story 
right at the end of, of verse one, verse, uh, chapter one, verse 11b, where it says, at that time I was a king's cupbearer. During the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was seen, being set before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had never been sad in his presence, so the king said to me, why are you sad when you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. And I, I was overwhelmed with fear. And I replied to the king, may the king live forever. Why should I not be sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? So the king asked me, what is your request? So I prayed to the God of heavens and answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor with you, send me to Judah and to the city where my ancestors are buried so that I may rebuild it. So Nehemiah is a, is a member of the royal court in Persia. And specifically, his job is to be the cupbearer, right? He's the food taster. Now, his role is not to make sure that the food is good. His, food is, his job is to make sure the food isn't poisoned, right? So he is a daily guinea pig, right? He's a daily guinea pig for the king. Because the easiest way to get rid of the king was just to poison him. Right? That, so every single kid in those days had somebody who drank his wine a little bit first and ate his food, and then they'd wait a little while. And if he didn't, wasn't sick, and that's what the king says to him, he says, well, you're, you clearly don't look like you're having a, a reaction to poison, so why is your face sad? Right? So this is Nehemiah's role. So he has a very close relationship to the king, and he's very trusted, but there also is a requirement that when you're in the king's presence... You need to make sure the king believes that everything is good in the world. So no sad faces. No whining. Right? When you come in, you make sure that he believes that he has made the world into paradise because he is the king. That's your job. And if you came in and you weren't happy in the king's presence, it could be a life sentence. And so... Nehemiah is in the king's presence, and the burden for his people is so evident on his face, the king says, what's up? You're clearly not, somebody hasn't poisoned you, so what's up? And Nehemiah leads, lays out his need, and the king grants him favor because God is at work. So what happens in the intervening times is that the king writes a letter, and he says, you know what, I'm going to give you access to the royal treasury up to one trillion. I'm not going to give you three trillion, but I'm going to give you up to one trillion, right? Uh, to bring a little modern day culture in, right? And, and so he gives them a, 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 really a writ of advance on all kinds of resources to be able to reestablish really great worship in Jerusalem as he gets back there. He also gives him a military escort and he sends him back to be the governor of Jerusalem. You would think with that, kind of a, with that kind of authority behind you, it'd be all downhill from there, right? You, you've got a military escort. You've got the king's letters. You've got access to the treasury. The people who can print money are supposed to just give it to you. you, you I mean, it would seem that everything is on its, is, is going to be downhill, and, and the heart, heavy lifting is over. That's not the case. Even though he's on a mission of God, he runs into opposition, and it comes at him in all different ways and shapes and sizes. And I want to tell you that if you're really going to be serious about your spiritual comeback to God, it is very likely, if not inevitable, of the fact that you're going to face opposition. And, you know, there are some who would say that, that if you're not... If you're not facing opposition, right, then you're not experiencing the will of God. And there probably is a lot of truth in that because Jesus said, you know, hey, the world hated me, it's going to hate you. That's what John tells us. The guy who lived the longest is one of the original apostles. As he wrote in his third chapter of 1 John, he said, you know what, the world, if you love Jesus, the world's going to hate you. And that hate there is not a noun, it's a verb. They're going to come at you. You're going to have opposition. Now, I do want to warn you that facing opposition does not necessarily mean that you're on the right path with God. I think sometimes we look at it and say, well, if I'm facing opposition, then, then I'm on. That's not always the case. You really need to check it. 
And if you want some biblical examples, just think about Jonah. Right? Jonah's in the midst of, he's in a, he, a life threatening storm in the seas and he gets tossed overboard. He wouldn't necessarily look up and say, hey, you know what? I must be doing God's will. Because he's going the wrong direction, right? And God's trying to turn him around. Sometimes that happens. Or go look at the story of Balaam in Numbers chapter 24. You know, here's a guy who was a, a prophet, right? And the Israelites are starting to come back in to take, they're starting to come in to take possession of the promised land. And the Moabites are not happy about it. So they go to Balaam and they say, you know what? We want you to curse the Israelites so they'll lose in our upcoming battle. And and so Balaam says, well, let me, let me ask God about it, right? And, and he gets down on his knees, and before he speaks the word, God says, no. No, no. The Moabites come back and say, you know what? We'll, we'll write a blank check. You can fill it in for any amount you want. So Balaam is, he says, you know what? Well, well, let me see if I can figure out how to do this to get the money. So he starts to make this journey, and he's riding on his donkey, and, and, his, and his donkey lays down on him, his donkey won't move. At one point in time, his donkey's going off the trail, and, and he's just, and, and he's like, he, he doesn't know what's going on, right? And so God grants his donkey the ability to speak, see? So if God can use a donkey, he can probably use most of you <laughs> and me, right? So God uses, uh, uh, insulting your audience is not really a great thing to do, but I, I failed that class in seminary, right? And so, and, and so Balaam, it, it, it said, you know, and, and the, the, the donkey says, hey, play the tapes. How long have I been your donkey? Have I ever done this before? Don't you get the message? And it's just in that morning time, Balaam's eyes are open, and right in the middle of the path where the donkey refused to go, there's an angel with a sword who's there to take his life if he keeps going. Just because you're facing opposition doesn't mean you're in the center of God's will. But at the same time, just because you are doing God's will, you shouldn't expect it to be all downhill in your journey. So I th there's lots of ways we could go with this. Here's the one thing I really want us to do today. I think one of the, we need to expect opposition. But I think what we fail to do is to recognize that opposition when we experience it. And therefore, we don't react appropriately, right? Let me give you an example from my own journey, right? You know, my motto at my house, I, I just want it to look with my yard like I'm trying. It doesn't have to look good. I just want it to look like it's, I'm trying, right? Because having to look good is way too much work, right? I just want it to look like I'm trying. And we had this season where we had moles who were just ripping our yards apart. Anybody ever had that problem? Right, you know, and you get up in the morning and there's a new highway through your backyard, all these little bumps and whatever, and I'm out there stomping on them and doing, trying to figure it out, you know, and, and I'm trying all these initiatives. What I didn't realize that the problem was is that I had grubs. So if you just go out and get grub killer, the moles go away, right? So I recognized the problem, if you will. I saw the symptom, but I didn't really know what the problem was. I think sometimes we experience things in our lives, right? And we don't take the appropriate actions because we don't recognize it correctly when we see it. Another example, and maybe some of you men can relate to me, right? When you go into the pantry and you're looking for peanuts in a can, and your wife bought them in a bag, and you can't find them, right? You know, it's your expectations are what set you off. So I want to be able to give you some guidance today, to give myself some guidance, so that we can see the opposition and we can react to it appropriately so that our spiritual comebacks don't get derailed. So let me give you some things to think about. And I'm going to move through this really quickly because I have been praying about doing 30-minute sermons as we go back to two services because we got to get people out of here. here here's a, I, I just want to give you a few things to look at. One of the forms of opposition that we're going to face is when... People use our past history against us, right? Now, this actually comes from Ezra chapter 4. That's the book we just left, right? And there's, a, there's an occasion in there that actually fits in the time period that we're dealing with, 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 um, with Ezra and Nehemiah in this phase in the, in the mid-400s. The, the, the surrounding governors write a letter to 
the king, and they say, we know you've sent these people here, and you've given these letters of authority, and you've anchor, opened up the bankroll to them, but go look at their history. This is a rebellious nation. This is a rebellious city. They have not changed. If you allow them to do this, all you're going to have is problems, right? They're bringing up their past history. One of the things that you and I will face in our journey to actually energize the fact that we are new creatures in Christ, one of the things is, is some of the people around us going to say, I know who you really are. You really can't change. I knew you when. And they're going to try to convince you. The evil one's going to try to convince us that you can't do this. They're going to use your past history against you. You know, you're, you're, you're never going to be a gracious person. You're never going to be a forgiving person. You're, you know, you're going to go right on down the line. You really can't, you know, a birds of a feather can't change their stripes, right? Can't you? It's you're, you just who you are. And they're going to use that against you. And they're going to sow doubt in the, your ability to be a new creature in Christ. They're going to use your past against you. So if you're facing any of those moments right now, you're saying, you know, I'm, I'm trying to turn over a new leaf. I know that God stepped into my life. I'm a new creature in Christ, and I'm trying to live my life that way. And you keep hearing these voices to say, you'll never change, you'll never change, you'll never change. That's the opposition. It's the opposition. Whether it's coming from people or from the evil one or sometimes even our own self-doubts, it's the opposition. They use their past history against you. Here's a second one I want you to see. And these are all going to be in Nehemiah. Look at Nehemiah chapter 2 with me. I want to pick up with verse 9, and we're going to look at, at verse 10. So Nehemiah makes a journey back, in, and he's now in the promised land. He says, I went to the governors of the region west of the Euphrates, so that's the area of Palestine and whatever, modern-day Syria today, and I gave the king's letters to them. The king also had sent officers of the infantry and cavalry in me. Now when Sunbalat Son the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard that someone had come to pursue the prosperity of the Israelites, they were greatly displeased. One of the re let me let me drag this around, right? One of the ways that you and I will experience opposition in our spiritual comebacks is the fact that people around us have a different agenda than us. Nehemiah showed up. His agenda was to act favorably for the people of God. All the surrounding territories, they wanted to act in, in favor of their interests, not the interests of Jerusalem. And, they, and, and, and allowed Jerusalem was against their interests, and there was opposing agendas in our journey. And you're going to experience that in your own journey. Because you can't be in the world and of the world. And those are just different agendas. They're, ju they're just different agendas across the board. <laughs> Let me give you a couple of examples. But over in the book of 1 Peter, some of you may want to turn there. That's okay. Some of you may just want to make a reference to 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter is writing to these, these Christians who are, are, are living out their faith in, a, in an area of the world where, where Judaism and Christianity are just not embraced. And, and, um, and he writes to them in, in verse, verse, uh, chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, it says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh... Arm yourself also with the same understanding, because one, the one who has suffered in the flesh is finished with sin, in order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desires, for God's will. There's a difference. Either you're living for human desires, or you're living for God's will. Not all human desires are bad desires. So we can have good people around us, Nice people, the kind of people you want to live in your neighborhood, the kind of people you want to work with, that does not necessarily mean that they have the same agenda as those of us who are trying to facilitate and maintain a great spiritual comeback by doing God's will. Listen to the way he reads on. It says, for there's already been enough time doing that, right, what the when Gentiles chose to do. And he talks about all these negative sins. Says, in verse 4, they are surprised that you do not join them in the same flood of wild living, and they slander you. 
So there's going to be a difference of opinion that can occur, right, in our journey. This can happen in the classroom, at a middle school or at a high school. It can happen in a university classroom. It can happen in our workplaces. It can happen in our families. Because the agenda of self, even when it's wrapped up in wonderful looking things, is not the same thing as the agenda of righteousness and trying to live in God's will. And so you're, gonna, you're literally going to face opposition because there's a difference of gender for your life. Are you trying to please yourself or to please others, or are you trying to please God? Those two things are different, and you're going to face opposition, a lack of affirmation. Third thing I want you to see, because I'm moving fast here. Look at chapter 4 with me. So Nehemiah gets back. He hands out the letters. No things aren't popular. Middle of the night, he gets up and he goes out and he does a survey going around the city from the north to the south and back around. And, and he surveys what's going on with the walls. And then he tells the people why they've come and they begin to rebuild the walls. And again, Sam Ballot, Tobiah, and others are not happy because they have a totally different agenda for Jerusalem than God's agenda of rebuilding the walls. And this is what we hear in verse, chapter 4, verse 1, picking up. It says, when Sun Ballot heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious. He mocked the Jews, right, before his colleagues and the powerful men of Samaria. And he says, what are these pathetic Jews doing? Can they restore it by themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they ever finish it? Can they bring these burnt stones back to life from the mounds of rubble? Then Tobiah the Ammonite, who was beside him, said, Indeed, even if a fox climbed on, up on what they were building, he would break down that stone wall. What they're doing is they're questioning their competency. Can you do this by yourself? Nah. You think you can bring those burnt stones back to anything that's going to matter? Nah. You think you can finish this without us? Nah. Right? In fact, what you're building is so lame that if we just leaned on it, it's going to fall over. They're questioning their competency. And those kinds of same journeys will occur to us. And sometimes they're very, very subtle. Right? And I remember when I, when I was in college, you know, the, the school I went to kind of had an unusual format. We had a we had, we had, you know, our first and second semester, and then two out of the four years, the second semester started early in January and actually ended in the middle of April. But two out of the four years, you had to stay for a, for a six-week special class, right? And you just took one class and et cetera, and I was playing sports, so it was great. It was like being on vacation two out of the four years, right? Somebody cook your meals for you, and all you did is just go play, right? But one of those years, I took a class with the college chaplain. And it was called The Fundamentalist. And that was some stuff that was going on in, 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 our, in our nation at the time. And it was really a look at, at the rise of religious fundamentalism in the world, but specifically in the United States and specifically in the, rain, in the, in the arena of Christianity. And the, the chaplain was actually a guy who grew up in the same religious context that I had done. He had grown up as a Southern Baptist. It was very interesting, you know, when I would speak up against things in the class, right, because there, were, there was a sense to say, you know, if you really believe these things, then you're, there was a sense of, of ridicule that went with it, right, the mocking that we've just seen. And so I had some private conversations with him offline, very nice guy, and, and, and really in heart and soul, he really meant well. But this is what he very subtly said to me, you know, because my point was, you seek truth until you find it, and then you build on it. And his suggestion back to me was, if you ever stop seeking truth because you think you found it, you're intellectually incompetent. Right? And, and we're going to face those kinds of things. People are going to say you're small-minded. You're, you're emotionally weak. You need a crutch to lean on. That's why you believe in God. And the list is just going to go on and on. They're questioning your competency. This kind of stuff is going to happen. It happened to, it happened to um, Nehemiah, who had the king's authority behind him, and it still wasn't smooth sailing. It's going to happen to us because the world didn't embrace Christ. It rejects him. 
Not only are they going to question your competency, they're also going to question your motives. Keep reading with me and, and look over at chapter 6 real quickly. So the Israelites are making progress. The, the, the walls are going up. They're finally all connected to half height, which means that they're pretty effective at that point. The gates haven't been put in yet, but all the lumber's coming for that, et cetera. They're making real progress, right? And so what they want to do at this point is that the, the, uh, the, the opponents, if you will, Sunballot and his group, they want to try to lure Nehemiah into an alliance with them. And here's what they do. Look, look, at, look, at, um, look at verse 5 of chapter 6. So Sanballat sent me the same message a fifth time by his aides. So they were offering to meet and form an alliance and da 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 da. And he had an open letter in his hand. And this is what it said. It is reported among the nations. And Geshem agrees that you and the Jews plan to rebel. This is the reason you are rebuilding the wall. According to these reports, you are supposed to become the king and have set, even set up the prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim on your behalf. There is a king in Judah. These rumors will be heard by the king. So come, let's confer together. So one thing, they're trying to intimidate him to enter into this alliance. But what are they really doing to saying, we, we, we know what your motives are. You're not doing this for God. You just want to be the king. And the whole plan is not somehow to build a secure place where God can be worshipped faithfully. You're planning to rebel against the king, against the person. They're questioning their motives. Right? And, and, and that happens to us a lot in our spirits. So come back. Sometimes when you stand for truth, people are going to call you judgmental. They're going to question your motives. Right? They're going to say that you're prideful, that you're holier than thou because you stand for truth. And the list can just go on and on and on, right? They're questioning your motives. And, 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 and it's very powerful. You know, it's, it's interesting. We live in a time now where, where to, to, that if you do not fully support and celebrate somebody else's choices, then you hate. They assign motives to us and to others. You know, it really is... Oh, it really is possible to love somebody unconditionally, to respect their right to make their own choices, to honor them, to treat them with dignity, and also say, I do not support or affirm or believe in all the choices that you are making. It's possible to do that, right? But we live in a time where when there's a, a, a religious subculture that wants to say that if God is love, then love is God. And therefore, if you do anything that's unloving to somebody, then you really, you're a hater. You're not a God-fearer. God is love does not mean that love is God. Those two things are not the same. And, 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 and so our motives will be questioned in subtle different ways. And maybe some of you are already experiencing that in your journey, right? If you're saying, you know, I, I'm not going to go to the bar with you. I'm not doing this anymore. And what, oh, what's the matter with you? You're too good to be with us. Da, 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 that kind of stuff. You, you're hearing that stuff. It's very subtle. But when we choose to be set apart as new creatures in Christ, and we're trying to make this spiritual comeback, we're trying to build the, the walls of God's truth around our lives so that we can dwell in peace with God, those kinds of comments will be c coming at us. And we need to recognize those, right? Just one last one. There will be an ongoing sense of just trying to intimidate and then to pressure you. And, and, and th there's, there, there's all kinds of pieces that fit with a lot of this. You see this, they're going to get ready to get baptized, right? So we're letting them slip out and... Uh, so uh, we'll be ready to go at the end. So I think it's always better to acknowledge the distractions rather than saying, where are they going, right? Oh, what's up with that? You know, is it, they getting in the head of the line for the food? Anyway, so, <laughs> so now you know, right? There's going to be an attempt. You know, you're going you're to hear things like, you know, if, if, you don't, if you don't do business the way that everybody else does business, you're going to go out of business. That's intimidation, Right? If you, don't, if, you don't, if you don't play the game, you're not going to get promoted. That's intimidation. 
right? And, and there are ways, that, and you can just see it coming right on that. That's good, that stuff's going to come continually. So again, my heart today, as we look at this passage of Scripture from Nehemiah chapter, there's lots of things we could look at about how to respond, all this kind of stuff. The biggest thing I want to do is I want to equip you to recognize it. So that you're not trying to stamp on the moles, but you go out and buy the grub killer and get rid of the problem. And there will be opposition. Expect it. Be ready for it. And then pray. And I will tell you, this is, this is, the, way I, I, this is the way I would love to respond when I face this, this opposition. It's gonna, let me just, just read a few verses out of Acts chapter 4. Right? This is when, right after the day of Pentecost... Peter and John, you know, are preaching, and, and they come to the attention of, of, of the leaders and et cetera, and, and they are just, they're just getting, and so they're called in before the, the authorities, and they, they are pressured to change, right? They are pressured to change. They say, you know, you need to stop speaking about this guy, Jesus, right? You need to shut up and go away or else. And this is how, and, and their response is, whether it's right in the eyes of God for us to do what you've just asked us to do, we don't know, but we, we just have to keep talking about what we've seen and heard. And this is, this is their prayer. And since I'm looking at it in a different Bible, I need, I need to get the reference. From, from chapter 4, verse 29, they gather up, they tell what's going on, and this is their prayer. This is the way I hope you and I will respond when we face opposition. It says, and now, Lord, consider their threats. And grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders and are, that, that are performed through the name of the holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the whole place where they were praying was assembled. Here, here's my hope and prayer for you and for me, is that when we experience opposition in our spiritual comeback, that our response to it would be to pray and seek God. We're going to look at that next week. And then ask God to give us boldness in responding to it so that by God's activity, the place is shaken. Right? It's, it's powerful stuff. Expect opposition. Recognize it. Respond to it because the greater is he who's within you than he who's in the world. Let's pray together for just a minute. God, thanks for your word today. Thank you for the boldness of Nehemiah and his faithfulness. And we pray we learn from it. God, we do long for that day where there is no opposition to who you are and to your righteousness. But Father, until those days, grant us boldness that we may speak your name and your kingdom may advance. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, before Ken comes in the baptistry and, and, um, to baptize, I believe, four students today, um, I just want to talk to you about, about what we're doing here. I mean, so many of you come from different traditions where they baptize infants and et cetera. So why do we have this 300-gallon tank? And the water is relatively warm. I tried to see to that last night by getting the heater turned back on again. What, what, what are we, what are, what's going on here? For us, as we look at the scriptures, and we're not trying to pass judgment on what anybody else does, but for us, when we look at the scriptures, baptism is designed to be a confessional event. And this is what these students this morning are confessing to you. And we have children who are baptized and adults who are baptized. I think the oldest person I've baptized here was pretty close to 80 years old. But, but, the, but what they're confessing to you today is that they've died to an old way of life without Christ. And they've been born again or resurrected to a new life in Christ. So, the way, so when they come into the baptistry in just a minute, Ken's going to ask them about whether or not they really have a personal faith in Christ and they're committed to following after him. And after that confession, as they are lowered into the water, what they're saying to you is just like Jesus died for sin on the cross and was buried, I've died to sin. And just like he was raised up so that we could have new life in him, they're being raised up to say, I'm a new creature in Christ. There may be opposition coming, but I'm a new creature in Christ, and that's who I'm living for. And what they are confessing to you is what's happened inside of them, that the old has passed away, 
and then the new creature in Christ has come. And with that, they are confessing that spiritual experience to you. Hey, let me just offer a brief prayer, and then we'll let Ken come down into the baptistry. God, thank you for the privilege that we have of experiencing new life in Christ. And Father, I know those who come today to be baptized are saying to you, I'm all in. Jesus is all in me, and I want to be all in for you. I pray you'd honor that prayer as they confess what's happened in their hearts to all of us here today through obeying your command to be baptized. As we pray in his name, amen.